So guys, once again, you need note-taking materials. Um, if you would like to put it, is this loud? This seems loud. Always loud, is that? Hello? 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 Is that okay? Let me make sure I'm, okay, I think we're good. Hey, so guys, you need your books open to chapter five, you need something to take notes on, and then you want to title your notes, the same as the title for chapter five. Guys, today we're going to introduce the concept of thermochemistry. Um, but guys, before we do, there's a couple things that we need to talk about, and then we're going to dig in and get started. So once again, books to chapter five, the beginning, and then something to take notes with, and then a couple things we need to talk about. Um, so the first thing that I'd like to chat with you about briefly has nothing to do with chemistry, but it has everything to do with us. And so I'd just like to take a second. Um, so guys, the beginning of the year, I probably shared with you and maybe even teared up a little bit when I talked with you about how stinking good it felt to be out of quarantine and back at school, back with the people that I care about, including my coworkers and my students. And I gotta be careful how I say this, how much I'd really rather not be back in quarantine. How about that? If it happens, we'll be okay. Um, but guys, I think we can all agree together that it would not be our preference, right? Okay, so guys, and maybe I'm just disconnected and naive about this, but I really got the sense when we came back in August that we as a school community sort of felt like we were fighting a common enemy, right? It was like the enemy was being locked in our homes and learning over Zoom, and we were willing to make some sacrifices in order to accomplish that. So guys, understand I'm preaching to the choir, but what I am going to do is ask you as the choir to start singing a song. Um, because what, I've, what I have noticed is this. In August, people were careful. Masks were a huge inconvenience, but we were willing to make the sacrifice. We were careful not only with how we were interacting with each other here at school, but maybe even more careful with how we were interacting with each other outside of school. Well, guys, you'll notice there's a lot of people missing from this room. Um, we had, not in this class, but guys, Orem High School had more than 20 people get quarantined yesterday. Um, some as being COVID positive, some as being um, contact traced exposures. Um, guys, please, you understand this, right? You guys are the leaders of the school. Um, Every year as a chemistry teacher and as an AP teacher, I get to work with the most influential students in the school. Because whether it's, you know, athletically or through cheer or through academic connections, guys, you are the people that set the tone for this school. Um, what I'm asking you to do, and I'm not asking you to like get all militant and weird about this, <laughs> or do, <laughs> Emma's gonna throw punches. Um, Guys, if you ever have the opportunity to steer behavior in a direction that increases the likelihood that we get to stay in school, let me encourage you to do that. Um, we've already seen what happened at Pleasant Grove, Corner Canyon, um, schools that very, very much fit our demographic, and we're starting to see problems. Um, so guys, please, as much as you can be a positive voice into this conversation, let me encourage you to do that because I don't want to get locked in my house. So um, that, that would be wonderful. So anyway, have you guys felt that as well? Or is it just me and I'm weird and old and disconnected? That this, this sort of like we're letting down our guard a little bit? Yeah. Um, so, guys, again, I'm not asking you to become like some crusader, but maybe we lead by example and simply ask for our friends to do the same. I really think we have the opportunity to change the conversation, um, whether we like masks or not, because I stink and hate them. Hi. Oh, my gosh, do we have, you better bring like a box and a cart. Meredith? You can take credit. It's all right. It was all Meredith. 
<laughs> Thank you, guys. Are we gonna? How are we gonna do this? All right. You do got it. I have no doubt about your ability to make this happen. You seriously want all these? All right. You guys are heroes. Thank you so much for doing this. You guys are amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, ladies. Okay, so um, enough on that. So, guys, let's talk a little bit about then what we're up to today. So, um, thinking about the test. Um, guys, they're not graded. I haven't even looked at them yet. Um, to be honest with you, I think there's a very real chance that I will delay their return. Um, what you're going to find out later in the year is that sometimes I purposefully wait to give you your test back. Frankly, I've been known to even wait up to three weeks to give you your test back. Guys, the reason is frankly because I want you to forget all the material. So that when you then go back to rewrite the test, it's almost like you're looking at the questions for the first time. Um, that's not what I'm doing today or with this test. What I am thinking about doing, though, is letting Sophia take it. Um, but then I'm also thinking about letting our students that are out of class right now, not because of anything they've chosen, to come back. Um, because I would really like them to have the opportunity to be a part of this conversation as they're rewriting, especially their first test. Um, so with that said, I think we may wait until the tail end of next week um, to hand tests back. I think that most of our missing classmates are going to be back Wednesday or Thursday of next week. And then I think we may take advantage of it from there. Um, that also provides you a little bit more time to study for the quiz that we're going to take, right? So we'll, we'll do that as well. Okay, so guys, with all of that said, here is a huge transition in this class. So guys, think about the test that you just took. Think about the anxiety that you felt as we moved into that test. Think about what Ronnie is struggling with this right now, because may I share what you said? So Ronnie's like, now I'm really scared because I feel like I did okay on the test. And I've talked with other people that said it's the hardest thing they've ever done. Therefore, even feeling like you did well feels bad because now you're doubting yourself, right? It's an absolute no-win situation. Guys, understand that a lot of that is because everything that we did in the previous unit, except for a couple small little tweaks, was all review. If you knew how to balance equations, if you knew stoichiometry, if you knew acids and bases, if, if you knew those things from last year, you had a better experience in this unit, right? Okay, here's the deal, guys. Starting today in Chapter 5, we are all equally ignorant. Okay? None of this for the rest of the year relies upon you remembering from last year. For the rest of the year, guys, we treat material as if it's new. We will call on principles from last year. But guys, this is largely brand new to all of us. So guys, with that said, grabbing your books, let's page through chapter 5. So guys, thermochemistry is the topic for chapter 5. As we get into this, I'm going to ask you, please, in this unit, to make a covenant with me. You ready? Please do not Google anything that we talk about in this unit. Promise? More importantly, if you do Google it, do not go to Wikipedia. Okay? Because, guys, seriously, one of the things that we're going to learn about tomorrow, is, next time, is called the first law of thermodynamics. And if you Google and then Wikipedia, the first law of thermodynamics, your head is going to explode. So guys, understand, in a general chemistry class, which this is, there are things going on that you don't need to know about. So guys, I know that some of you get curious about these things. You want to start digging around. Please, 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 especially with the first and second laws of thermodynamics, do not look them up. Or if you do, please filter what you're reading through what we're talking about in class. Because, guys, these are very complex principles that can lead you down a ton of distracting rabbit trails. So stay with me. Is 
No, because it's edited. Um, that's the magic of the community, is their proposal is that if people put up stuff that is not in fact true or factual, but then it becomes a question of who determines truth. Um, but it does get edited out, especially in scientific journals. It does pretty well. So guys, with that, said, join me, and here we go. So guys, this chapter starts out very generically just talking about energy and things rolling up and downhill, which then gets us into talking about bonding. Then guys, on the next two pages we are going to have a little language lesson where we are, going to, we are going to define some terms very, very clearly. And we're going to end the day today by playing a little game with this stupid block of brass. And all of a sudden you're going to go, hey, there's more to this than I thought, but I actually understand what's going on. Then, guys, we get to the first law of thermo, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we call internal energy. Guys, understand this is where we're going to pick up on Friday as well, but we will touch on this briefly, especially as we talk about internal energy as it relates to heat and work. We will also talk, guys, if you've taken physics, about how we think about this differently in chemistry as we do in physics. Then, guys, turning the page to 169, we are then going to get into really big idea number one, which is enthalpy, okay? So for the rest of the chapter, this becomes a big conversation about enthalpy. Now, guys, with that said, go back to chapter 19. Go with me to chapter 19. Go to page 789. So guys, moving back to page 789, if you were in any way like connected, especially given your chapter summaries with what we just talked about in chapter 5, you'll notice on page 789, um, it comes back to this idea of system and surroundings. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But then guys, as you change the page to 790, you will then notice there's another big old E word. See it there? Entropy. Now, guys, go back to page 169. And you'll notice that there's another E word called enthalpy. Guys, this is why I'm asking you, and I mentioned chapter 19 is a part of this. Guys, this unit is chapters 5 and 19. But guys, please do not start dabbling in 19 because the logic that holds true for enthalpy is not true of entropy. And then eventually we'll bring them all together into something called Gibbs free energy. But guys, we're going to dig into chapter 5 in great detail and then we'll invite chapter 19 in when it's appropriate um, as you start to get a better sense of how all this stuff works. So, guys, with that as a big picture introduction, let's go ahead and dig in. And guys, what we're going to do today is we're simply going to define some terms. You're going to be writing frantically to get all this stuff down. I would encourage you to be selective in what you choose to write down, especially if you've taken physics, because you probably already know a fair bit of this. Um, and then, guys, slow me down if you need. But really, today, all that we're doing is bringing in some terms and some concepts that are going to provide the foundation for this entire unit. And then, guys, all of this, as I said, is going to culminate in us playing with this piece of brass in a way that brings all these ideas together, and it'll let you gauge whether or not you really understand. So guys, if we're going to talk about thermochemistry, the first thing we should do is define it. So you understand chemistry is the study of atoms. What about thermo? Heat and energy. So guys, thermochemistry is defined as the study of energy changes as they affect chemical reactions. Now guys, understand you could make a career out of this. You could become a thermodynamicist and you could spend the rest of your life studying energy exchanges and reactions. The really cool thing about this is many times that leads to you thinking about batteries. And if you want to change the world, spend your life figuring out how to build better batteries. We'll talk more about that in chapter 20. Yes. Does it like also explain why metal 
Well, it's interesting, Spencer. Um, so does it also explain why metals rust? Uh, we could even back that out another step and say this explains why everything happens. Literally. And we're going to get there, guys. We're going to talk about in chapter 19 what is called spontaneity. No, we'll talk more about that later. So, guys, with that said then, if we're going to talk about energy exchanges and reactions, guys, the first thing that we need to do is we need to define what the word energy means. Now, do you guys, do you remember when we defined this last year? I don't remember if it was pre or post COVID. No, it was pre COVID. Do you guys remember our definition for energy when we talked last year? You don't remember it. So let's just talk about it. So guys, if you remember early on last year, we talked about physical changes. Remember, physical changes don't change the state of the material. We talked about chemical changes that do. And then guys, we simply said this, that energy is the ability to make a change. So if you want to change something, that requires energy. But guys, it turns out that this is not actually the technical definition of energy, and you need to know the actual definition of energy. So guys, the actual definition of energy is this. Energy is the ability to do work or transfer heat. Now gang, as we talk about this, this seems perhaps overly simple. But this is actually the comprehensive definition of energy. Guys, it is simply the ability to do work or transfer heat. Obviously, we're going to talk more about work and heat in a minute. But guys, that's it. At the very fundamental, that's what energy is, is the ability to do work and transfer heat. Now, guys, from there, and I think this is probably something you already know. You guys understand that there are two types of energy, right? Do you know them from life or physics? Yeah. What are the two types of energy? Potential and kinetic energy. Guys, let's talk a little bit about what you need to understand about those things. So guys, we're going to do kinetic energy first. Largely because kinetic energy is the thing in here that we do the least. In physics, it's probably the thing you do the most. But guys, we do need to at least create a common, a common vocabulary. So gang, what is kinetic energy? When you think of it, what do you think of? So uh, we got to be careful. So not quite the energy needed to move something, but yeah, so it's the energy that something possesses when it's moving. And Ronnie, I know that sounded weird, but we're going to talk in a minute about systemness. Um, and when we talk about systems, the kinetic energy is actually the energy that the thing, the system possesses as it's moving. If it's me, so like for example, our block, if I were to throw this to you, when it leaves my hand, it now has kinetic energy. But understand the kinetic energy that this thing has as it flies came from me, but initially that wouldn't be kinetic, it would be potential energy, and we'll talk more in a minute. But guys, understand at its root, kinetic energy is simply the energy of motion. And it's quantified like this. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared, where mass is m and v is the velocity of the thing squared. Guys, later we're going to talk about putting units to these things. You maybe have heard that kinetic energy is measured in joules. Um, if that's the case, then mass has to be in kilograms and velocity has to be in meters per second. If you want to scratch that down, we'll talk more later. But guys, understand, if we're going to measure kinetic energy in, um, in joules, then masses have got to be in kilograms and velocity has got to be in meters per second. We'll talk more in a minute. You guys doing okay? You're keeping up? Okay. So guys, if that's kinetic energy, we, can I switch slides? We then need to talk about the other type of energy. And for us, I would suggest even the more important type of energy, which is potential energy. 
So guys, this for me is the point at which this almost becomes magical and mystic. So let's talk. If kinetic energy is the energy of motion, what is potential energy? The energy of not moving. No, say it again, Chandler. It's stored energy. But you were going to complete your sentence, and I cut you off. What were you going to say? Yeah, store, okay, you, I missed the word up. So guys, it is in fact stored energy. So gang, this is the point at which we need to pause. Give me examples. Please. Say it again. No, give me, give, but give me specific examples. Where, where do we see stored energy? Landon. Okay, so we can store energy with gravity, right? And guys, again, I know that some of you know this, but we need to create a common conversation. So let's, we're, and we're going to do this today. Let's pretend that the table is the ground because it's hard to see the floor. So guys, let's say that that's ground. And right now, this block does not have gravitational potential energy because it's on the ground. But if I lift it, now it has gravitational potential energy, and we can get that energy back by simply letting go. So guys, gravitational potential energy is an example. Other examples of potential energy. I saw more hands earlier, yeah. Absolutely, so, and I think some of you may have even drawn that picture in your four quadrant. I always love your pictures. Yeah, so absolutely. So there's a motor that drags the, the car to the top of the crest of the hill, and now you got all this potential energy, and the rest of the ride is just us trading potential for kinetic energy, which is, and all of that happiness that makes you giggle and do it again, right? So guys, other examples of potential energy. Beautiful. So guys, let's talk about that. So let's do this conversation. Guys, where do we get our energy? You right now are alive because you have fuel inside of you that is actually fueling you. And guys, where do we get our energy from? From food, right? So guys, food is just a way of storing energy. So if I've got a bag of M&Ms stored inside of here is energy that we then ingest and muck up and spread out. And now we've got energy to move, right? So guys, where on earth is the energy stored inside a bag of M&Ms? Okay, so that's how we measure it. Calories are our units of energy. But guys, where inside of your food is energy stored? It's the bonds. Guys, we can store energy in bonds. And Spencer, that's exactly what you were talking about with chemical potential energy. Just a second. Guys, other examples of storing, stored energy, right? Other examples of stored energy. Please. Sort of, but understand that act of pulling your arm back, you are actually loading a muscle that you can then, but it's actually the contraction of that muscle that allows you to transfer energy. We'll talk more in a minute. But understand, ultimately, that ability comes back to your M&Ms, right? No food, no muscles, no contraction, game over. Please. Great. This is actually called elastic stored energy. Yeah, but interestingly, the reason that this works is actually an atomic thing. It's kind of like storing energy in bonds. It's actually more like intermolecular forces because what we're doing is we're distorting intermolecular forces that then come back. So guys, let me give you an example. How about that? A battery. Guys, batteries store energy. So let's let that be our exhaustive list. Guys, we've got gravitational potential energy. We've got the potential energy that is stored in bonds. And we've got the potential energy that's stored in rubber bands. And, just a second, and we've got the potential energy that's stored in batteries. Guys, this is where this becomes mystical. 
they are all actually different flavors of exactly the same thing. What's the common thread? <laughs> yes, storage. Potential energy, stored energy. But guys, the same thing that's going on in that battery is going on in my pack of M&Ms, is going on in the gasoline that fuels your car, is going on in this block as it's just waiting to let go. So guys, fundamentally, we're asking and answering this question, and this is where this becomes almost poetic. Guys, how are all of those different forms storing energy? No? Here's the answer. Attraction and position. Guys, all forms of energy, all forms of stored energy, and this is cool if you really think about it. Guys, all forms of stored energy always come down to attraction and position. So let's do this again. So guys, gravitational potential energy. What's the attraction? Gravity. By the way, guys, why does gravity work? We still don't know exactly. We understand that it's probably about a curvature of what we call space-time. But guys, the why do things attract? Why does the north and south pole of a magnet attract? Fundamentally, we're not exactly sure. But with that said, you ready? You need to look for attraction and position. So this block is attracted to the Earth. Right. But right now it doesn't have potential energy. Why not? The position. So now we need to give it position that allows us to store energy in the attraction. Do you get it? Okay. So now let's talk about bonds. And rather, guys, than getting gasoline molecules, not yet, Spencer, rather than getting gasoline molecules and carbohydrates, let's just take water. Guys, there is energy stored in these bonds. Where's the attraction? Don't miss this, guys. Where's the attraction? Let's look at this molecule. You may want to draw this with me. So, guys, we've got an oxygen with eight protons. We've got a hydrogen with one proton. And we've got a hydrogen with one proton. That's a water molecule. Where's the attraction? To what? What do the circles represent? Electrons, right? So guys, here we've got a pair of electrons. Both of these nuclei are attracted to those electrons. There we've got attraction and the potential for storage. Guys, here we've got a shared pair of electrons. Same thing. Both of the nuclei are attracted to that. We have attraction in the potential for storage. So guys, what about batteries? Well, in a battery, we've got a positive end and we've got a negative end. And what do positives and negatives do? They attract. We have attraction with the potential for storage. So guys, fundamentally, Every single way that we have of storing energy can always be mapped back to attraction and position. Here, it's the position of the protons and the electrons. In a battery, it's the position of the electrons. Because, guys, we've got a positive end and we've got a negative end, and there's more electrons at the negative end than there are at the positive end, and those electrons want to go from negative to positive. And when that happens through a wire, we now have a current and our, light, our flashlight works. But, guys, all energy storage can always be brought back to attraction and position. So, guys, let's flesh this out. So, guys, and... Potential energy, then, guys, is the energy of position. And this energy is stored relative to an object's attraction for other objects. Understand, those objects could be electrons. But it's always about attraction and position. That's a really good question, and we don't need, you're talking rest energy and rest mass, and we don't have to include that in this conversation. 
it does relate and there are answers, but we don't need to dig into it. So guys, are you settled on this idea? Do you find this as intriguing as I do? Isn't it interesting that there's something fundamental in our universe that says there's energy and attraction? Come on, go there with me. Come on. You guys are not romantics. It kills me. But it just wasn't intriguing enough. Oh, man. All right. So, guys, let's do this then briefly. When you think of potential energy, guys, the first examples that you brought up were roller coasters, and I forget, it was all about gravity. So, guys, we need to talk about it. Gravitational potential energy depends upon mass, position, and the strength of gravity. Now, guys, understand in this class, we are not going to talk about gravitational potential energy. Here's the reason we do mention it. Because, guys, it becomes a phenomenal analogy for what happens in smaller systems like atoms and bonds and molecules. So, guys, if you understand position and strength of attraction and things like that with gravity, you can then map that onto what we call electrostatic potential energy. So guys, electrostatic potential energy is the attraction between charged particles. This is where we live as chemists. Why do positives and negatives attract? Again, guys, we don't know. We know they do. But fundamentally, we're not exactly sure. You've taken it on faith since you were first introduced to this when you were in like seventh grade. But guys, fundamentally, we are not exactly or completely sure why positives and negatives attract. What in our universe glues them together? And we're not exactly sure. But with that said, guys, for us, our positives and negatives could be protons and electrons, which leads to covalent bonding. We drew this picture. Oh boy, I shouldn't have done that. But guys, our positives and negatives can also be ions. But then guys, it can also be polar molecules, as in the example of intramolecular forces getting us, I think, Chandler, you mentioned the rubber bands? Yeah. So guys, fundamentally, if we've got attraction, and if we can move positions, we've got a place that we can store energy. Okay, so guys, are we all settled on that idea? We okay? Okay. So now, gang, we're going to move forward. We've got a fundamental idea about potential and kinetic energy, now what we need to do is bring a new idea into the conversation. I hope that this is tickling your ears from having summarized uh, chapter 5. Guys, one of the things that you ran into is what is called total internal energy. And guys, total internal energy is defined as the sum of all the kinetic and potential energy in a system. We're going to talk about this a lot. So guys, this is definitely a term that you need to have a handle on, total, in, total internal energy. You okay? So gang, now we're ready to talk about units. When I originally asked you, where do we get our energy? Somebody said calories. And that's absolutely true. But guys, understand that the calorie is a unit of energy and not a source of energy. In the same way that a pound is an amount of matter, but not the matter itself. So guys, when we then talk about energies, we need to talk about units of energy. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the joule. And guys, I understand right now this is interesting, but some of it's mindless because you're just writing down definitions. Guys, it's just work we've got to do. So when we talk about the joule, we're talking about this. Guys, let me even talk to you about it before we do it. 
So guys, this is the definition of a jewel. Can you imagine a two liter bottle of soda? Imagine that two liter bottle of soda moving at about one meter per second. And if that bottle ran into the wall, it would transfer one joule of energy into the wall. So guys, the technical definition of a joule is actually the amount of uh, energy that a two kilogram mass possesses when traveling one meter per second. But guys, remember what we talked about when we talked about kinetic energy. We said kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. You don't need to write this down, but just watch. So guys, let's plug in our numbers. So we've got one half, what's our mass? Two kilograms. What's our velocity? One meter per second squared. Do the math. What's one half of two? One. What's one squared? One. What's one times one? One. That's where we get the joule. Guys, technically the units for the joule are kilogram per meter squared second squared. You don't need to get all caught up in that other than to understand that the math works out and we do end up with one. So, this however guys is a very, very small amount of energy. And so consequently, what we do typically is we use kilojoules. When we start doing math, well, until we get into chapter 19, we'll, we'll go back to joules. When we start studying these energy changes in reactions, we'll typically use kilojoules. But guys, understand, I know that for you, the joule is not the familiar unit of energy. Ronnie, I think it was you that said it. What are our units of energy? Or was, or was it some female voice over there? Yeah, the calorie. So guys, that's the one that we're accustomed to. Right. But guys, here's the thing that's interesting. This uh, little bag of M&Ms is actually from Germany. My son brought these back to me when he went to Germany a couple of years ago. And actually, all of the energy content on the back are in kilojoules. Yeah, it says right here, this bag, and it even says energy. It doesn't say calories, right? In America, we're afraid of getting fat, so we're like, ah, calories bad. In Europe, they actually exercise and they need calories, so they just call it energy. And guys, so energy, it says this bag contains um, 2,144 kilojoules of energy. In Europe, many times, food is labeled with their kilojoules rather than calories. But in either case, let's talk about the relationship because this is what we know. So guys, this is a definition you do need to know. We're going to talk more about this in lab. But guys, technically the calorie has a definition. The calorie is defined as the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water's temperature one degree Celsius. Tuck that away for now. It will become wildly important shortly. Well, when I say shortly, I mean next week. But guys, there is a relationship between the calorie and the joule. They're both units of energy. The relationship is 4.184 joules. So fundamentally, a joule is about a fourth of a calorie. But guys, here's the tricky bit. These calories that we're talking about, the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water temperature, one degree Celsius, a fourth of it. Guys, this is not the calorie that's on your food. If you have any food in front of you, and if you read the nutrition label on the back, this is not the calorie that's on your food. It's actually capitalized. Guys, this is a lower C calorie. A dietary calorie is actually a kilocalorie. So if you eat a Snickers bar, and if that Snickers bar has 250 calories of energy, it's actually 250,000 calories of energy, given our chemistry definition of what a calorie is. 
So if you are on a 2,000 calorie diet, which is probably about average for us, you're looking at 2 million calories a day. So why don't we burst into flames? That's a lot of energy. We use it differently, and our bodies are masters at taking all that energy and controlling its release, storing some of it, using some of it, some of it passes through. But guys, our bodies are masters of of monitoring this. Understand that if we were to take our our 2 million calorie diet, grind it up and light it on fire, it could explode. And do you guys understand that's actually how they figure out how many calories are in our food? They literally do that. They, you can do, it's called bomb calorimetry. And literally what they do to figure out how many, oh, to figure out how many calories are in a, in a thing, in anything, they dry it out, ground it up into a powder and light it on fire in the presence of pure oxygen. And then what they do is they use that fire to heat water. And by knowing how much energy, by knowing how much the temperature of the water went up and what it weighs, they can then work backwards and figure out how, many, how much energy this has. Guess what we're going to do in lab next week? Yeah, but guys, seriously, that's, that's how they figure this out. It's called combustion analysis. They, they take the food, they dry it out, they grind it up, they light it on fire, they use the flame to heat water, they figure out the mass of the water and how much the temperature went up, and that tells them how much energy is given off. Every food, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, they burn good, they just don't burn very long. Yeah, yeah, but that's exactly how they do it. All right. So, guys, we've now got two things sort of in our quiver, if you will, Guys, we understand kinetic and potential energy. We're beginning to appreciate this weird idea that potential energy is all about attraction and position. We now understand how we quantify energy through both the joule and the calorie. Anything there y'all want to talk about? Okay. Now, guys, this is where this is going to get a little different. This is important. When we talk about um, energy exchanges... Guys, these are words that you are going to have to quickly get familiar with. So guys, when we talk about energy exchange, we have to define our frame of reference. And in doing that, we break the universe into two parts. We talk about system. And Ronnie, this is what I was getting at with you earlier about the throwing the ball or whatever, or the thing having energy or getting energy. So guys, system is defined as the portion of the universe that we are singling out for study. But understand, guys, this is a big idea. And this is going to be one of the things that initially you are going to struggle with most when you start thinking about thermochemistry in the context of reactions. The very first thing that you've got to do when you approach this problem solving is you've got to define your system. And guys, the process of system definition is critical. But the thing that's cool is you have all the authority. You can pick whatever you want to be your system. But if you pick wrong, you're in trouble. So guys, one of the things that we're going to work on is picking systems. But guys, once we've identified our system, everything else in the universe becomes what we call the surroundings. So the surroundings are everything else. But now guys, we need to define a very important term. In this class, and frankly, in thermochemistry in general, guys, when we do, well, it's really not until your junior year in college that this changes when you get into what's called PCHEM, um, physical chemistry. Guys, when we talk about system and surroundings, our systems will always be what we call closed systems. So allow me to define for you a closed system. 
A closed system is a system in which energy can get in and out, but matter can't. So guys, a closed system is a system in which energy can be exchanged, but matter can't. So guys, with that said, here's what that means. Energy can be gained and lost, but the law of conservation of mass can never be violated. You see how that fits? Does that make sense? Okay, so guys, this is a term you've got to understand. Our systems will always understood to be closed, which means energy can get in and out, but matter cannot. You okay with that idea? We got one more thing to talk about, and then we're going to play with this metal block. So guys, here then is where we are. We've talked about potential and kinetic energy. We've talked about quantifying energy. Now we understand at some level this idea of system and surroundings. Our system is the part of the universe we're studying. Surroundings are everything else. And now we've defined some rules about how these things interact. So when the system and the surroundings interact, they can exchange energy, but they cannot exchange matter. Is that okay? Okay, so here then becomes the last thing we need to talk about. Guys, matter cannot be exchanged, but energy can. The question is this, how? How does energy get between the system and the surroundings or the surroundings and the system? And guys, there's only two answers to this question. This is the last thing we're going to talk about today. So guys, how does energy get into or out of a system? And the exhaustive list, guys, is two things. There are only two ways to, to affect the internal energy of a system. But guys, as you write that down, I fear that some of you are doing that blindly or too casually, which is why I underlined the words internal energy. So guys, as you're writing that down, please remind yourself, what is internal energy? We'll talk about it when you're done writing, and then we'll talk about how this happens. So guys, what is internal energy? The sum of the kinetic and the potential. But guys, how many different, follow this thinking. Internal energy is the sum of kinetic and potential. But guys, how many different kinds of energy are there? Kinetic and potential. That's it. It's not like you're going to go to college and all of a sudden some university professor is going to go, hey, yo, there's a third kind of energy. Guys, that's it. It's potential and kinetic. So when we talk about internal energy, we're talking about all the energy that exists. And when that energy is associated with an object, we call it internal energy. It is literally the kinetic and potential energy of a system. Now, guys, there's only two ways to make that number change. How can we give an object more energy? Or how can that object give more energy to us, to the surroundings? And guys, this is the list, work and heat. And again, you're not going to get to college and have some physics prof go, hey, here's number three. There is no number three. Guys, there's only two ways to get energy in or out of a system, and that is work or heat. Notice the abbreviations. You're not going to like this later. So guys, work is a little W. Heat is a little Q. Well, wait until you find out that enthalpy is H, but it's not the same as heat. Oh, yeah. It gets worse. Uh, just to make it hard. I know. If only we were in charge. We, oh. So, guys, let's talk about these. Ready? This is important. Guys, work is defined as energy that is used to move an object against a force.
and then allow me to define force and then we'll talk about it. Force is defined as any kind of push or pull that is exerted on an object. So guys, one of the ways that we can change the energy of a system is by doing work on it. So guys, I don't know if you've had this experience and forgive me if this is offensive to any of you, but I am so sick of driving I-15 and being in the middle of the never ending construction zone. Yeah. And I don't know if you've seen this, but it seems to me, and I'm not being derogatory, but it seems that sometimes I have this thought go through my head. You'll see these guys working and they got their vests on and, and they work hard. But guys, it seems like more times than not, you'll see like 10 guys crowded together and nine of them are leaning on their shovels. And there's one guy that's down in the ditch throwing dirt. And I always think to myself, those guys aren't doing any work. Are they? Let's talk about the... Let's... Ah, so guys, if I am leaning on a shovel, am I doing work? So is there resistance? Well, yeah, there's resistance because my shovel's in the dirt. And if I were to try to move the shovel, there would be resistance in the intermeshing of the things that make up the dirt. So I've got resistance. But why am I not doing work like... To get this straight in your head, work requires two things, resistance and movement. So if I'm not moving, I'm not doing work. But guys, understand the other side of this is tricky. Can we get rid of resistance? And then you start thinking about traveling through outer space and there's no air friction. There are other kinds of resistance. We don't have to dig into them a ton here. But guys, what you need to understand is that there, and by the way, that kind of resistance is inertia but we don't need to go there. That's a physics thing. But guys, all you need to fundamentally understand is that work is force, against, is movement against resistance. Is that okay? Okay. Then guys, let's talk about heat. Well, there's your equation. It's just force times distance is work. But then guys, let's talk about heat. Heat is defined as the transfer of kinetic energy from a hot object to a cold object. So guys, we're going to talk about this for a minute. And then we're going to play. So let's talk heat. So heat is the transfer of uh, kinetic energy. What do we remember about kinetic energy? Energy of motion, right? So it is a transfer of kinetic energy from hot to cold. So guys, the first thing we've got to understand is this. Energy always flows, heat always flows from hot to cold, never cold to hot. You understand that fundamentally what that means is there's no such thing as cold. There's no such thing as cold. There's simply less hot. So guys, energy always flows from hot to cold. And when we think about it that way, there's no such thing as cold. There's just less hot. So guys, do this with me. You're sitting at your desk. Grab the leg of your table. Does it feel hot or cold? feels cold, right? Why? 
because your body is 98 point something degrees and this leg of the table, which is in the room, is 70 whatever. So you are hotter than the table leg. Therefore, energy is flowing from you into the table leg. Guys, the question is why? Why does energy flow from hot to cold? Okay, and that's true, that eventually if we hold on to this long enough, it'll come to the same temperature. But guys, what we've got to understand fundamentally is this. What is hot a measurement of? If I'm at 98 degrees and if this is at 70 degrees, what's different about me than this? I do have more energy, but physically what's different? That's it, it's speed. Guys, my molecules are 98 degree molecules and they are moving faster than these 70 degree atoms. Hot things move faster. And so when I grab a hold of this, my hot molecules are slamming into these slow atoms. And just like cars, when they collide, if one car is going 100 miles an hour and one car is going 10 miles an hour, when they hit, the fast car is going to slow down and the slow car is going to speed up. Same thing here. When you grab a hold of this table leg, the molecules in my hand are slowing down. The molecules in the metal are speeding up. So guys, when you have the physical experience of something feeling cold, what it, that is actually a, an experience of is your molecules slowing down. Hear that again. Guys, your mo when, the, when you touch something cold, your molecules slow down. As your molecules slow down, that sends nerve impulses to your brain that said, uh-oh, slowing molecules, that's cold. If this happens too much, I'm going to die. Because understand, your experience of cold is actually the experience of your molecules slowing down. That's why heat always goes from hot to cold. The idea is that hot is always moving faster, so hot can speed up cold, and energy never flows this way, because cold has less energy than hot. Does that make sense? Okay. So, guys, with all of that said, this is the rest of our day. Guys, here's what we're going to do for the next five minutes. We're going to play a little game with this block. Here's the Here's assumption, assumption that we're going, that we're going to, make. to make. Ready? Ready? Because this, this is everything, everything you need to know in a nutshell. In a nutshell. So, so, so one, 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 is one is this. this. We are going, we are going to call the table, 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 table to the ground. ground. I, understand I understand that this block is going to fall to the ground. ground. So we're so going to say that say it can't. can't. And that's and ground. ground. Okay. Okay. Now here's the next thing that we're going to say. That block is our system. So guys, so guys, this, this block, block is our system. Our system. What, does what does that make? That makes table, table and Daniel, Daniel and me and, me and everybody, everybody else. else. The surround okay. round. Okay. okay. Now, guys, yeah, guys let's, talk let's talk about, about the internal the energy, energy of our system. system. The internal energy is the sum of its kinetic and potential energy. So let's talk. Does this block have potential energy? Now we need to talk more about our system. Guys, we are not going to talk about the atoms that are inside this block. Because if we were talking about the atoms, they're in a crystal lattice. And that crystal lattice does have an energy associated with it as it formed and then it's stored. We're going to talk about the block on its own. So we're going to talk gravitational potential energy. So does this block have any uh, potential energy? No. Does it have kinetic energy? Well, we know the atoms are wiggling. But we're talking about the whole block. So does it have potential energy? Kinetic energy? Also no. OK. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to change the internal energy of this block. You ready? Come on, block. Change. Come on. Hold on a second. So guys, is, is there any way to change the internal energy of that block without interacting with it? Can the block change its own internal energy? It cannot. Guys, the only way the energy of this block can change is if something in the surroundings interacts with it to give it energy. Does that make sense? Now, 
I am now going to be the person, the thing in the surroundings that is going to give this block energy. But there's only two ways I can do that. What are they? Work and heat. Get it? The only way that I can give that dude energy is work and heat. So guys, let's do heat first. And I touch it, and I'm warmer than the block, and technically it does make the molecules move faster, but that's not the energy we're talking about, so let's not do that. I could heat it up, but we're not going to do that. We're going to do work. So guys, I'm going to give that block energy by doing work on it. Ready? So here I go. So I'm going to grab this thing, and I'm trying to give it more energy, but I can't. Because in order for me to do work, what are the two things I've got to do? Move it. And it's got to be against resistance, right? So what is the resistance that's keeping me from moving this? See how that comes full circle to attraction being the only way we can store energy? Huh? Okay. So, guys, I am now going to do work on this block, and I am going to move it. Remember, distance and opposing force. So, guys, I'm moving this block, and as I do... What is happening to the block? Well, the block is now moving. So the block now has kinetic energy, right? We've got mass times velocity. So this dude now has kinetic energy. So what's happening to the kinetic energy of the block? Is it going up or down? So I'm moving the block. It now has kinetic, it has mass and velocity. So what's happening to the kinetic energy of the block? It's going, it's going, it's going up. But what's happening to my energy? It's going down, right? How much does my energy go down compared to the energy of the block going up? It's the same. That's called the first law of thermodynamics, and we'll talk next time. But, guys, I am now adding energy to the block, and the energy of the block is going up, and now we're going to stop right here. Ready? What is the kinetic energy of this block now? Zero. It's not moving. What is the potential energy of this block? Well, whatever this represents, right? So now, guys, let's give it numbers. Ready? So let's say I do 100 joules of work on the block. So 100 joules of energy maybe looks like this. So now this block has 100 joules of energy, just using round numbers. Is that kinetic or potential energy? Poten it's potential right now because it's not moving. Now, guys, here's the trick. Can I get that potential energy back? Let go. Right? Because, guys, it's got 100 joules of potential energy right here. No kinetic energy because it's not moving. But when I let go, what happens to the potential energy of the block? It goes down because it's closer to ground. What is happening to the kinetic energy? It's going up because it's accelerating. So, guys, here's the idea. We're going to drop this in slow-mo. So right now, 100, 100, let's call it 100, 100 joules of potential, how much kinetic? Zero. Now, what about this? What about when this block is right above the table? What is its potential energy now? Basically zero. What's its kinetic energy? A hundred. Minus air friction, right? As it falls through the air, it is losing some energy in the form of heat to the air. But guys, as this thing falls in a vacuum, all of its potential will have become kinetic energy. So let's do it again. How much potential? 100. How much kinetic? None. Now, it's down here, right above the table. How much potential? Fundamentally zero. How much kinetic? 100. And then, boom. One more minute. Boom, and it hits the tabletop. Guys, what is its potential energy now? What is its potential energy now? What is its kinetic energy now? Zero. Where did the energy go? Into the ground in what form? How did the energy get out of the block and into the ground? It did work on the table. It actually moved the table a little bit. But that's it, Spencer. Also in the form of sound. But guys, sound is work. Literally, these molecules push on the air. And does the air move? Those are sound waves. And so, guys, literally, the energy comes out of the block in the form of sound, doing work on the air. But, guys, also it comes out as heat. The table's a little bit warmer than it was before. Do you get the idea? Work, heat, internal energy, the whole shoot and match. Okay. So, guys, with that said, here's your homework, and we will regroup third period.
So guys, there is your homework. Let's take a break. Kaylee, have a great day. And guys, let's uh, write this down and we'll turn it in on Friday. Go get them.